Okay, here we go. I think it's recording. Yep, I see it. It's so many things. Okay, thanks. Um, sorry about that. So, trying to fetch the tool to, to show you in case you, you've seen this tool before. So I was using this tool, which I don't have, it's not that I'm really trusting it, but it did help me go move forward with the errors. You would, uh, I, I was just looking at this and looking at other examples of, uh, of, of deployments and things. And I was, I, I was able to move, keep moving forward. And I think one, so adding this init container here was part of that process of going through the errors to get to a point where I could deploy this with customize. So what Nolan is saying is not something that I know for sure, if you know for sure, but I would investigate because it might be the customize has restrictions that cube control doesn't have. Is that a thing? I'm honestly not sure. Um, I haven't played enough with customize to really know. Um, okay. So I can't tell you for sure. All right. I, I just, I didn't want to be shooting in the dark too much. That's why I wanted to have, have this quick call. So just to get some, some information, if anybody had any, but I'm pretty sure I had to add this back here to move forward. And maybe once I get through and clean everything up, it might be that I'm able to go back and remove things. And that was not actually the issue. I don't know. But that might be an issue. If it is an issue, is it okay if we start out the, the deployment with like just bogus name and then patch it later? We don't have to decide I'm, that right now. Yeah, I would I would be very, very surprised to find that customize required every pod to have init containers. Um, so my guess yeah. is that there's something else going on. Well, I, I don't know that it's, Stepping back, I don't think it's that it requires the pod to have init containers. I think having worked on some YAML-based tools for Ansible, I think that it's if you specify a, a path in in some overlay, that the path may already need to exist. Like it's it's not necessarily init containers by themselves. It's something to do with YAML pathing, and maybe they don't want to add something to it. Um, but I'm not for sure that that's the case. Yeah, I had a hunch that that's what was happening, that Customize was sort of scanning what I was trying to load and sort of like anticipating that that needed to be there. And that's why when you got to, to this point, it was saying, hey, later on, you're going to try to add this, but it's not there originally. So that, that was a hunch I had. All right, well, why don't we move on from yeah. this and we'll, we can right. sort it out down the road. <laughs> All right, so uh, the other thing I wanted your help with was, give me a second. Um, so, so if this is, is a bit relevant though, because if this is a thing that Customize does, this sort of scanning everything and making sure that it's there to begin with, then, the uh, the um, sorry the pl plugins directory which is here sorry um what is it? I don't never mind I'm too tired I, I'll I'll bring this up later let me move on to the version A stuff. So here, backup storage location. So I, I initially had this with like the, the items keyword and um, just like that, this original, well, it's not there anymore. Anyway, it, it was complaining of the formatting and I started changing things around based on newer, uh, YAML files that I was seeing. And so 
Sorry, this actually this is how I started out the deployment. But customize was complaining about the format. So I was looking at other ways to format the YAML file and this worked. So I removed these top two items here, this these top two elements here, and just put three dashes, the API version, and did it did it this way. And then I separated everything with three dashes. And this this format mark worked. However, I had to change a few things. Um, one significant one was, <clears throat> excuse me, I had to follow this format, which is not the way, <clears throat> excuse me, is not the way that, uh, that we have the outputs from the install, the YAML outputs. So basically, add a schema, add this, and this is under versions. This is also something I needed to add. So I might be doing this wrong. I mean, it's not as wrong in, in the sense that this is valid, but this might not be what we want. If we do want to go this way, then my question is, uh, I'm not really clear if we should be using V1 beta or, or V1. And versions here, which versions we would want, is if it's one or more than one. Basically, what, they say so it's what version we support. Can, can I? ask you to back up and, and what kind of failure were you seeing? So it was the same, the, so <laughs> good question. The, this was in the process of trying to make the customize deploy this to my cluster. And I, I wouldn't get any specific failure. I would just get, um, I'll, I'll get this YAML would be highlighted. I was using a different, uh, a different uh, editor but you highlight some like an element with a red you would highlight red and say okay there is an error here but you wouldn't tell me what the error was so through poking around i was able to eliminate the format error by follow by doing it exactly like this and this I, the way i figured this out was by looking at all the yaml files that i found uh, actually on the contour um, the contour has a customized proof of concept too. Of course, it looks a bit different, but I took the formatting for, from that. So this made those formatting errors go away. Okay, so my second question is, what, where did the file in this middle pane come from? The, oh, the middle um, pane? Yeah. This? this is a representation up here of the backup storage locations. And this came from the, I just pasted here the output from the original install uh, YAML file. Okay, so Valero, back, Valero install will generate this? Yeah. Okay. E except, mm -hmm. yeah, generated okay. this exactly. I haven't cleaned this up yet. So this would customize, would, or, or my browser customize would balk at this but I will have to add versions and do it this way. The, the reason I'm asking this is so the one on the left looks correct to me in looking at the, all the schemas stuff that I've been looking at for what's necessary for a, um, for a CRD to define a schema, at least in V1 is it would have the version, it would have spec dot versions. Mm -hmm. And then each one of those versions would have a name. Here it's V1. Um, and then underneath that, each version of the CRD. So we have V1 of backups and V1 would have its own schema, which has an open API V3 schema. So on the, on the left, it has, that looks accurate to me. Okay. Um, so this is what we want. However, that's based on V1. I don't know for sure if uh, V1 beta one had a different layout of the fields because I know there is a, a structure in the file called um, backup or not backup, uh, custom resource validation. Mm -hmm. there's, a, there's a structure that's, uh, I think the schema? 
field. The struct the, the field is named schema, but the structure is called valid backup resource validation. Um, Which is this. Right. So I'd have to double check that. So I don't know if that changed in the process of going from V1 beta one to V1. Um, so I, I don't know for sure. And I'd have to look at the output. I um, think it I changed, it but I was surprised that if I use V1 beta one, this stuff is, it made me very confused. Yeah, I don't, do you know, are you using, um, like, um, uh, this is presumably some sort of Kubernetes language server that's checking against a Kubernetes server for validation. I was, uh, so I just opened VS Code right now because I couldn't find a way to maximize the font on Goland, but I was using Goland. Oh. I hmm. okay. haven't used it for a long time. I suppose they are using some, yeah, I do have a Kubernetes extension there, which I think we are using okay. something. Okay, I'm I'm curious what version of Kubernetes they auth they they validated against. Well, but, the I can like if you know or if you can recall like take a minute thinking and recall and give me some pointers is fine. I just needed a break before I thought this about this again. But in what I really would need to know is when, like, what, what, what is the output that we want uh, from our commands once we have this? So let's say it's version 1.4, that, that this gets into version 1.4 of the layer. What API version do we want to be listed here? And in in, in if we are going to support multiple versions, uh, do we want just one? Do we want v1 and, and beta one? That's uh, my question. Or do you want me to investigate what we should do? Just wanted to have a direction. Well, so the the version like in line seventy six, and the versions at lines ninety two and ninety three are two separate things. So the first one is like you know for the CRD itself. Um, are you creating it as a v1 beta 1 CRD? This stuff is very hard to explain clearly, but for like for now we need to create them as v1 beta 1 or at least have the option to create them as v1 beta 1 because any cluster prior to 1.16 doesn't have the v1 API extensions API. It doesn't have it at all? No didn't the v1 api extensions api uh launch in 1.16 prior to that it was just v1 beta 1 really i thought it was supposed to be a okay um okay i'll that seems to violate the stuff that they've mentioned in their docs because it shouldn't have gone straight to preferred version without incubating. Anyway, V1 beta one is where where it should where line uh, line seventy six should be V1 beta one because that gives us the broadest um, segment of Kubernetes versions. And then and on like it, line so, sorry. 93. It, would that be true for all the objects, for example, for services, deployment, everything? No. Okay. That's only for custom resource definitions because um, custom, custom resource definitions are, are V1 beta 1. Okay. Um, the rest are versioned on their own. And then similarly, we're line 93. Um, is our version of the backup CRD. So we're saying the backup CRD, uh, or yeah, this is the backup CRD. So we're saying the backup CRD is version one. And that, that line we control. Okay. So we would say, like, this is, this is a line that we would bump and say, hey, we have a beta version of backup, or we're moving the V2 of backup. Okay. So do we want- But as of right. 
as of right now, we only have one version and it's V1 for all of Valero's CRDs. All right. So how about the other, let me see here, if I find, uh, namespace, V1. Yeah, so these things, I guess I'll just put it on the, I'll, I'll, I'll make the best out of it and we'll fix it in the PR if, yeah. if I get the wrong version. Well, yeah, so a CRDs should be API, uh, API extensions.cates.io slash v1 beta one, and then the rest I think can be as they are. Deployments apps slash v1 beta one. I think that one should be V1. Yeah, I immediately put my foot in my mouth. Um, I mean, at, you know, every API group is is at a different version. Um, right. They all they're all moving independently um, because they have different SIGs that manage them, and they all move them um, independently. And so they all they all have their own deprecation cycles. Um, some of them will and and you know they'll straddle at different at different points. So because depending on the version, the 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 keys can have a different spec, right? The the what's going to be allowed here is going to depend depend on this version, or am I wrong? By the way, I don't have a cutoff anymore because Tim canceled our own, moved our own one for Friday. So if you have time, I have time. Yeah, I don't have anything else. Um, yes, the, so there's two, two things that come to mind that rely on that version. Um, the fields that are in there and usually in Kubernetes, Excuse me, I think the, the CRDs have been the exception so far that I've seen. Excuse me. Um, being um, usually from beta to the next version, it's not, there's not significant changes. Um, so usually, but not always, um, from beta to the actual version, the fields will stay pretty much the same. Um, and then the other thing that will change is the imports because the import path is linked to the version mm -hmm. um, in the code. So those are the two main things that come to mind. Um, and I think we had, this may have been in the Helm chart, um, we had users change uh, this particular one from apps v1 beta one to apps v1. Um, so like our Helm charts aren't necessarily in sync with the YAML that gets um, pushed, which we, we know. Um, but, and if you answer this, I'm sorry. <laughs> do we know, do we have an opinion on what this should be? Or do we know for the purpose of this new CLI organization for, for deployment in specific? Because deployment, I, I think, think I think deployment is is big enough and, and important enough that we need we should nail what the version and make sure that all the fields are conformance. So for deployment, I'm pretty sure we want it to be v1 because v1 beta one has been removed from current versions of Kubernetes and v1 has been around for enough versions that you can create a deployment through the apps v1. API on any Kubernetes version we support. Yeah, for the new command, it should definitely be v1. v1. Okay, and, and is this correct? Apps slash v1. Yep. Okay. Yeah, um, apps apps is I think um, old enough that it got it doesn't have to do the fully qualified path. So like it was before before they started doing stuff like API extensions .io, apps was um, before they start formalizing some of this stuff. Okay. 
So I could be wrong, but I'm thinking that if we, if I nail what the the YAML files should look like for each command, then is is we just reverse engineer from there. You know what the code changes will need to to be have to be whatever will output that YAML file. Um, another question I have. The let me see. Trying to find the file I want to show. All right. Is it possible? Because I actually looked through the codes and I couldn't really figure out how the YAML was being printed, was being outputted. Um, is it possible if I if we do, let's say, the layer plugin adds a plugin and just output a partial like this exact deployment? Is is it possible to determine what to output? Because I wouldn't want to get at the point like the, all of the the a bunch of keys that I wouldn't that 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 particular YAML wouldn't need. There's probably not a super straightforward way to do this. I mean, because we're basically constructing Kubernetes deployment API objects and then outputting them as YAML. I feel like we'd probably have to do, you know, use some kind of YAML processing library to do like a YAML diff. I don't know. What do you think, Nolan? Um, I think if we, my, my, my thinking here is, and Carlicia, you're asking if we do this in the plugin com command, like if we do plugin add, this is purely an example, but plugin add dash dash dry run. Yeah, exactly. Um, my thinking here is um, if we generated uh, a deployment and relied on nil fields, we might be able to not have them. So that might work, but I think we might have to massage it some more. Yeah, in, in my head, we're making a new, we're basically making a deployment, filling it with some of the information, and then spitting it out and relying on it being a patch. Yeah, That's exactly. Fine. So now that actually I'm thinking about it, if if we get a but like all a bunch of, of fields that are not relevant for this, and let's say they're empty or nil, I, and we say, I'll oh, just patch the deployment with this new YAML, then you will obviously override. So the the one way I'm thinking that is that we would have to fetch the deployments, build the outputs with the with with the current values that are there, replace the ones we want to replace, and then output the whole thing. Yeah, the the fetch runs into the case where you don't necessarily like it. It still stumbles on the case where you don't necessarily have a Kubernetes server up and running yet. Mm. Um, because I mean, we can, similar to how the install command works today, we can we could spin up an empty deployment struct, fill in these fields, and then give it to a YAML um, uh, uh, serializer and spit it out. But I don't remember what fields might get automatically nilled, um, and like you know auto-populated that we would have to delete. Um, but I have, my, 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 the first thing I would try would be fill in these fields that we care about, print it out, and then see if there's anything that's extraneous that maybe we could delete. Yeah, ideally, it would just be enough fields to like identify the deployments, Add the the required fields, and add the fields we want. And like, I'm also thinking if we had like a predefined Valeros deployment struct somewhere, so one that we build on, so it already has like the metadata name or you know, the selectors and the template. So all all you had to do is plug in the secrets and the init container in info. Um, so you like imported a pre-populated image from somewhere 
uh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, a pre-populated deployment struct from a Valero library. Um, so you didn't have to fill in all of that stuff each time. Mm. Um, so we already had stuff like namespace and stuff like that. I'm just thinking of a, a shortcut helper. Um, yeah. There's nothing preventing us from just importing a bear, just importing the deployment from the Kubernetes code and, and adding all that as is right now. Um, yeah, but you, except if the cluster is not running, then we'll not be possible. Well, we could, we can import, we can import the struct whether or not we have a cluster and just build the struct without submitting it. Yeah. That's kind of what I was thinking uh, versus uh, saying, hey, Kubernetes, give it to me. I'm just thinking like build it on the client side and then spit out a serialized YAML doc. With the, just these values filled in. Right. Yeah, well, it's gonna, okay, might, might get tricky. <laughs> we'll see. Oh yeah, I'm not, I'm not saying like, that's my first pass. Yeah. I'm sure it'll be trickier than that. <laughs> um, not saying it'll be easy. Um, the CR, CRD stuff is, proven that that's that's uh the case <laughs> so but that that's that's kind of in, in my head that's where i would start all right um anybody has any concern uh, is this going in the right direction any heads up that i haven't thought about so far as far as, far as these yaml files I mean, so the, I'm just stepping back and thinking about the general flow here. So the idea is that if you're a user who, who basically just wants to pre-generate some YAML and check it into Git, you'll essentially have a dry run flag for all of these new CLI commands. So you can dry run Valero init to get the base install. You can dry run Valero plugin add to get the patch to add the plugins that you need. You can dry run Valero backup location create to get a backup location defined. And then all of that stuff can be piped into customize. Customize can essentially render it all into a complete set of YAML and then that YAML can be checked into Git. Is that, does that cover the kind of the overall flow? Yeah. Yeah. So basically, all you need to do, and we can give examples because it's very simple. It's like if you if you look here on the on the left at the file structure, you can say base version one point four, let's say, and here is we. I mean, we can. This is not, for example, this file here is not just deployment. It has services. It has the RBAC stuff. So we can rename this something else. But basically. This is everything for the basic deployment. Then if they run, like you said, set the backup loca storage location and that's all they need, then you go in the customized file and just list those two files, super simple. And then you have the overlays, which is going to be what plugins you're going to need. So you have another custom customization YAML file here that you list, okay, I'm going to, uh, deploy this plugin, and then I'm going to use that base. That base shouldn't really change, just depending on what plugin you use, you put it here, and that's it. As far as, I, <laughs> as, far as I'm thinking. And um, yeah, so, so this just pl plugin YAML will contain deployment stuff that will have to be patched into the original one. And just to make sure I'm understanding, so would, would any of these YAML files be, are these all generated at runtime by the Valero CLI or are you, you saying some of these are checked into our Git repo? Okay, so, so let's say if I'm, so I don't know how people really use this, but I'm thinking that this is how, is how it works. So the answer is no, they should not be checked into our repo unless we wanna have like an example um, yeah, we can have an example, but some, I mean, the, the, the credentials, for example, would be bogus. They have to replace them anyway. So the idea is if I'm a user, 
I do, I run all of those four commands, like init, get a YAML, which will, go, which will be this, this one here, deployments, or if we, my name is something else, or whatever, like they're just gonna pipe it to a file, right? And we can document this. So they'll pipe this to a file, they'll, they'll pipe the backup location that they just create with a dry run to a file, they dump everything somewhere, we can give, document this and say, hey, dump it to a for the named base, base, and then they're gonna add the plugin, they're gonna pipe that into a YAML file, they're gonna name it or whatever, and they're gonna have a, a, another customiz customization YAML that is structured like this, that's going to determine, okay, my base is here, and then this, this is the plugin that I want to add patch on that base, and that's it. Okay, yeah, that, that makes sense to me. Um, seems pretty reasonable i guess the one thing is i would want to go you know tr again try and look at a couple other projects and see like is this similar to structures to flows that other projects are using where you have kind of a cli to, to generate various parts of yaml that can be all stitched together through customize yeah i know um uh sort sort manager has is using customize too and they have uh I actually looked it up. They have both a, a repo. I, I'll add this to the PR. And they have a blog post, which I haven't finished reading, uh, explaining how they, their workflow is. But looking through the repo is, yeah, this is the idea that they are using. OK, yeah, I mean, it, it definitely seems, um, it seems to make sense to me, yeah. And so since you brought up cert manager do they also officially support helm or is that a community supported thing i don't know but i can look okay uh part of the tricky thing here is making everyone happy <laughs> that's that's kind of the 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 rock and the hard place we're, we're in right now there's no generally accepted way to put stuff into a kate's cluster so um yeah, trying to trying to make all of those happy is just sucky. Yeah. If if the patching works, the patching of this the the plugin works with customize. It looks very simple. Just give them the YAML. They organize. I mean, if you know customize, you you know where you you need to put things. You know how how to use the customization customization YAML. It seems so simple. I mean, the hard thing is coming up with a properly formatted YAML file or, or output. Yeah, and <clears throat> the thing that made me lean towards customize is I, I think there's a standalone customized client that like doesn't exist in Cube Control, but Cube Control has customized support. So. Um, at the level that we're supporting it, like we don't have to go full on with, I'm not 100% clear whether cube control is like customized light, you know, in that it doesn't have all the features or what, but in my mind, it makes sense to use the features that are built into cube control because that's what most people will have on hand. Um, if they want to reach for Helm, we're already, we've got that, um, but I don't see any, I don't see a benefit to, unless they're, without, without knowing the features for sure, I don't see a clear benefit to like going all in and saying, yeah, we're gonna support the customize that's not built into Cube Control. Yeah, no, right. I'm not even using the customize tool at all. Right. I'm only yeah, using it's just it with the Cube built in one. Yeah. Yep. If it doesn't work yep. with I that, <laughs> I just need to make it work with that. So. Right. I, I think I think using the lowest common denominator one there is a really good target for us to start with because pretty much everybody's going to have it. And then yeah. if some other tool comes later, we can worry about it later. <laughs> I, I'm finding customized so much better than Helm, but, but people might have specific needs that. Helm addresses, I don't know. This is so yeah, much Yeah, and, and some people may just 
have their whole deployment set up in Helm and they're just going to stick with it. Like the switching cost may be super yeah. high at the moment. So yeah. that's fine. Um, so I, I don't see the harm. I, I don't currently see a crap ton of harm in trying to accommodate them. I mean, it's, it's, it is extra engineering effort, but, um, I think it's worthwhile to not force one installation tool. Yeah. Yeah. I think there are so many, there are enough uses of Helm that we should keep supporting it for, for what it's worth it. I think that if there are no more comments about this, would you be, would you two be willing to just scan through that PR feedback? Yeah, I saw you replied, but I just sat down before the meeting, so I didn't I didn't get a chance to reply to it. Yep, I've got time. I I also haven't really seen the uh, comments you added. Yeah, it's. I think it'll be like we, we can nail this in five minutes, and then I can start sure, working yeah. on it. Let's see. All right. So this here, yeah, totally makes sense. So basically, this is not needed. We literally need to kick off what this would do. Yeah? Okay. Sounds good. Uh, okay. <laughs> I was laughing when I saw this. So basically, I wrote it down here, but I'll just say it. Um, I took the image dash dash images flag from Valor install, dumped it in here, and didn't think about it again. But so what you said, Steve, is right, what you both said. So, the, but, but then I had a question. Do, do we want to support the ability to add multiple, multiple plugins? Like we, we supported that with install, but not with the actual plugin add commands. So now I have this question. I think it, you know, it'd be nice to support it and you can also just do it as multiple positional arguments. So you can just say Valero plugin add, you know, Valero plugin for AWS, Valero plugin for GCP, which is consistent with our existing commands. Like you can say Valero backup get, backup one space, backup two, and it'll, you know, get both of those backups for you. So it's just, it's just basically two positional arguments. Yes. But actually, I have to I have to revisit that because I think. No, that's fine. Yeah, I could do that. So that was my uh, spacing out there. Yeah. Oh, that's accurate. I agree. Okay, so this is a just wanted to get a clarity on this because just to make sure. So. What I was thinking was to have Valero in a verb. So with that intent, I was thinking to rename the server to init, but the functionality will be the same. So this was a de deprecation in name and not in functionality. And I don't, I'm not, I wasn't sure if it was clear or not. And in, in if it was, if this is not right. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a little confused there because so in my mind, there are two separate commands, both of which we need, right? Okay. So Valero, Valero init creates deployment, like creates the Valero deployment, like generates YAML and applies it to an API server. And the Valero server command is, is the command that's run inside the Valero pod. It's just the process that Valero runs to okay. run all the controllers and everything. So like one is something that a user runs to get Valero set up. And the other one is what is the process that's running inside the container on the server. Yeah. You know, it probably would have been better named like Valero serve rather than server. I guess if we wanted to have a verb there, but this is not something a user ever runs unless they're developing and running it locally. This is just what the process that's run in the Kubernetes cluster in the in the pod. Okay, so how about all of these flags? Did the user ever did the user ever use these flags? They may if they edit the deployment. 
so the the most common one is uh, log level. Yeah. So um, if you go in right now, the way you edit it is you go in, edit the deployment, and add two extra YAML lines to say dash space dash dash log level, and then a new line dash space debug or whatever log level you're changing it to, uh, or you're changing the log format. So these are a lot of them. Uh, I mean, users don't use them directly. Um, and, and also the restore only. Restore only. Um, you may use some of these I had asked about storage because um, the default backup storage location, like right now, we say Valero server. This is the name of the default backup storage location. Um, so when the process starts up, it grabs that and just holds it in the process. Um, we've talked about putting an annotation on the locations and things like that. Um, but at the moment, right now, all it does is either it just looks for one called defaults, looks for a single one, or grabs this, um, this argument. Should we be displaying this to the user at all? I think it's documented, but honestly, I don't know. There's a lot of stuff that I thought was documented that isn't. Um, but should we? Yes. If it's not, we should. I'm sorry, we should display or not display? Oh, display? Um, I thought you said explain. Oh, um, I'm mixed on that. Like, I don't know that we want to hide it completely because if you know how Kubernetes works or say you want to run this locally on your laptop and play around with it, there's no, nothing stopping you. Yeah, that's true. We do run it locally. Um, I had dumped all of these flags. I was not uh, completely tuning into that in, under the init. So I'm going to remove that and just leave this alone. Well, so one, one thing to think about here, right, is when, you're, so when you run Valero init, your output is basically a Kubernetes deployment. And it would probably be nice to say to, you know, when you're running Valero init to have an option to say, you know, I want a client QPS of 50. And then basically that flag just gets passed through and, and configured as a, as a flag on the Valero deployment. So you add, yeah, so the, the, the deployment has the arguments and like Valero server that starts out the server. So basically we could add, edit the deployment, but then when we have to, to redeploy it, it right? Because it wouldn't be just, there, we have to do two things, edit deployments, if we could add these things to the net, because I mean, some of this makes sense to me, but then how can we trigger the uh, redeploy? Uh, when you edit it, the Kubernetes, Kubernetes will scale it down and then redeploy okay. it. So, um, So basically some of these flags make sense or all of these flags make sense to go under init? Yeah, I, I don't know. It's, I don't know that we need to expose them all through Valero init. I mean, many of them are kind of, are, you know, advanced things or things that like 99% of folks are never gonna tweak, like the plugin dir or the metrics address, you know. And so adding them to Valero init may, means that there are just more flags on that command. Right. Mm -hmm. One could make an argument for putting them on Valero configure um, so that there's, um, I know you, you had removed the Valero config command, but to make it a verb, um, to make it a verb in a second step, if you did Valero configure mm -hmm. and abstracted it so that you say Valero configure, this thing, Valero configure set or whatever, um, client burst. Mm -hmm. And yeah. you abstracted it and we then 
like for now we set it as a thing on the um we set it as a flag on the deployment and then we abstract it so that maybe we, later we move it and store it somewhere else right where we're just instead of making them edit the deployment we could change how we store it um all right so i'm thinking we should table this and maybe maybe i can open a, a ticket to take a look at this but not as part of this pr yeah i i think it, it could it could easily be a rabbit hole um or maybe just leave it alone it, if you look at valero install like you know, some of these are exposed and we've basically added things as users have asked for them to be exposed yeah. through Valero install. Yeah, it, it was tricky with Valero install because like initially I was like, no, none of them. And then people asked, I'm like, okay. And then it became a big pile of things. So it's, um, you can easily like have an explosion from Valero, yeah, uh, you like, know. Like this. Right, right. and like the concept of a Valero configure command. Um, like if I'm thinking Valero configure, like that basically gets massive if it, if it's setting individual flags. Yeah. And then, and then people are going to want the get version of that. Right. And then a separate config file and yeah. You could also, you know, consider adding a level of indirection here. So instead of having each of these as, as like a proper flag on Valero init, you could say Valero init and then have a single flag called dash dash server flags and then have like a string of key value pairs. So you could say client QPS equals 20 comma restore only equals false, but it would mm -hmm. just be a string value. So then, then you don't have to add a new flag to Valero init every time you add a server flag, but yeah, that's um, point. yeah, so that's an option. I'm going to leave it alone for now. <laughs> okay. I think I, I like more, like rather than adding, uh, like what you, Steve just said, just a string of options. Um, I think I'd rather have a config command, configure or set command if we were to, to do that. But I think I'd rather leave it yeah. alone. I think we, I have a lot of like this PR can get it's already big in scope <laughs> yeah yeah oh yeah so this is spaced out on that i'll fix it i'll fix the documents all right so let me just All right, I'll try to add, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm jumping around to the end because I think I just want to focus on that question that Nolan had. Um, I'll come up with an example for the rest day. Okay. Yeah, and the, the rustic one was mostly for, to help me understand um, as some of the stuff moved around, how or a rustic in scenario would would work yeah w once i upload the those yaml files which i'm trying to do only when i get this to work it will be easier to understand put together the commands and then you look at what should be the output of the commands so there is one last question here sorry i'm all over the place okay Sorry, I passed it. Okay, this is the question, which is also same sort of question, but it's a, bit, a little bit a little bit further down. Um, yeah. Where and how to store the information for defaults? So basically, what I'm thinking is. It would be nice to start in the spec of the location because it's, it is an attribute. But if that means we would have to fetch all of the locations and, and iterate through them to find out which one is the default, then that's not, that should not be the way to do it. 
So I'm thinking alternatively, we will have an annotation that we can query, like an annotation on where I, on the pods, I'm not clear. I'll have to look more into that, into it, but. Okay, the, um, for querying, I think a label, a label, I don't know if a field selector would work, but a label um, like um, Valero.io slash default storage location equals true. Um, yeah. Would be a label. And so you can do a label selector, which you can do queries on, uh, which would be faster. And it, um, that would work. Yeah. Um, so that's, they, that's one option. And then when we print, when we do like um, Valero backup storage location get, then we get a printout of all the locations. Then that I was thinking of adding a column to say defaults, and then have an indication for which one of those are, are the default. So then at that point, we can also query the label. Right. I would love to use a field and a field selector, but I think the field selectors are really restricted. Like you can only do stuff like name and type and things like that. Like I, I don't think you can do an arbitrary field with a field selector, um, but I'd have to look again. Because like you mentioned, it's, it's, um, it's an attribute of the BSL. Um, so putting it as a full field in the BSL, like in the, I don't know if it would be on the spec or the status. Um, but like directly on the BSL itself, not as a label would be cool, I think, but um, it might just be easier to put it on a label. Yeah, for querying purposes, it would be definitely more efficient. We wouldn't want in both places, right? I don't think that is a need. I don't think so. I don't think so, but if a, excuse me, if field selectors are for some reason, um, more restrictive than label selectors. I think there's there's some implementation details with etcd for that for that. Um, but um, a label selector would do the job for sure. Yeah, and that's I mean that's definitely how storage classes work in upstream Kubernetes with the label and the label selector. So yeah, yeah. So yeah. it's a convention that exists, and I don't I think field selectors are kind of new. So I don't know how many versions back they were introduced, but again, like I, I think they're restricted to a certain number of fields. Like it's only like the stuff that's in um, object metadata or something like that. So I don't think we can put, we can't create a new arbitrary field and put, put a label selector on or a field selector on it, but we can create an arbitrary label and put a label selector on it. So I, I, think, I think that's um, a, good, a good route to go um, for backup and snapshot locations or storage and snapshot locations. All right, sounds good. I think that's all there that was. Um, yeah, anything else that I didn't bring up now, I just said, yeah, you're right. So I'll, I'll update this PR next. And I will figure out those uh, those YAML files and try to make customized work. And then hopefully that will work and I'll upload those files to the PR too. Cool, sounds good. All right, thank you. Yeah, thank no you for talking through this. Yeah, sure. Bye. See ya. Yeah. If you if you want help with any of the customized stuff, if you just want to want us to run it, um, feel free to throw the YAML up somewhere and, and grab it and run it against uh, run it against the client cluster or something. Okay, awesome. Oh, that's another thing. I blew up my I tried to up, update my cluster yet last night, and and then I blew it up, and now I I had to reset my password <laughs> on AWS and. I didn't know what, you, what my old password was, so now I have a ticket yep. open. <laughs> of course. Yep, I 
I did that, and I actually found out LastPass did retain my password, but they, the order I was expecting the password history to be in was reversed. Um, so I got it and was able to reset it, but yeah, it's a pain in the butt. Yeah. Uh, oh, it's fun, fun. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Have a good afternoon. You too. See ya. Bye. Bye.